Hi, Ian, how are you today? Yeah, really good, thank you. Great, thank you so much for being our next you know, victim on uh, 10 questions with. Um, I know that you're relatively new to the company, so I think that this will be a very um, beneficial uh, interview for the rest of the company to, to get to know you better. So uh, to that end, if you wouldn't mind, why don't you just begin by telling us for the record, your name, your title, and, and what it is that you'll be doing for Actilis. Yeah, sure. So my name's Ian Jennings. Uh, actually, 52 years old, so I know a lot younger than I uh, than I look. Um, and uh, the official title is is President and and uh, SVP Head of Europe. So uh, I'm transitioning to take over from Denis Mikol, and I've been in the company about 35 days at the time of recording. So relatively new, huh? Yeah, that's great. Well, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So. Um... Let's start with what project or challenge in your career has had has been the biggest learning experience for you. What what's brought you to this point in your career? Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny because in, in you know where I've been going, there's been lots of little challenges along the way, some bigger than others. But probably the biggest one, I was in my early to mid forties, twenty thirteen time, and it was clear I had some gaps in my in sort of knowledge base, and I chose to do an executive MBA which was amazing, but probably the biggest thing there was someone like me, I'd been in sales most of my career, sales and marketing. I didn't do a PhD, so I, you know, I left university age 21, and I kind of had to learn how to learn again. You know, this, you know I had to learn sort of um, autodidactically, you know, as they say, read books. I uh, had to learn to, to write things down again, not, not with a keyboard. So, so that, was, that was really just the challenge of the process. And, and it's amazing how you spit, how you got faster at learning as you went through it. Mm -hmm. And then I think in terms of like reality, what topics it was classically, it was my weakness. It was the, the fairly hard finance topics. You know, I've always been strong and comfortable in sales and marketing. No problem there. Leadership has always been a nice topic for me. But but yeah, some of the, the, the more technical aspects of corporate finance was mm -hmm. um, was beautiful. Yeah, it was it was tough to do. Yeah. Well, you said so that you've spent most of your career in sales and marketing, as I have. But if you, if yeah. you weren't doing that, what what might your ideal job be? If you could rub a genie's lamp and make a wish to do anything else, what what might that be? So, I mean, I, I, after university, I got a biochemistry background, so I worked in a laboratory for a couple of years. It wasn't all be fulfilling, and and um, and actually, I applied for teacher training college in the UK. Oh. So I was going to be a teacher, and um, I think enrollment was maybe a September. I'd been accepted in, I'm going to say, like April, May time. So I had the kind of a summer, and, and during that time, you know, I a couple of job applications I had out going out at the moment were in sales roles, and one came up. It was, you know, compared to working in the lab, it was relatively well paid, and it had a truly awful company car, which I thought was, was amazing at the time, you know, what, one less thing to buy. So, sure. so I ended up going into sales and I thought, well, maybe I'll do it for a couple of months, defer the teacher training. And that was at the end of 1995. And I basically stayed in sales. But I think had I not caught the sales bug, I, I think I would have definitely gone into teaching. I don't know why. It was just it felt kind of cool and uh, imparting knowledge. And actually, I still like the coaching side of the job I'm in now. So a little bit still stayed with me, you know. Right, so there are touch points for sure between being a yeah. teacher and being a coach. It's this, some yeah. of the same skills. Yeah, yeah, it was so, yeah, interesting. Okay, so um, I know you're not long in this particular position, but you do have a, obviously a background in 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 sales and marketing, as you said, and in, in the chemi chemical space. I, I would presume. What yeah. um, what trends or or what changing trends are you seeing in our industry, and and what's your sense of how those things might impact Actilis moving forward? I think when we're not done with COVID yet. I don't mean the disease, although, God forbid, but that's still around. But it's more, you know, in COVID, we had a, a huge downside in 2020 when practically nobody worked. 2021, there was upside. Um, and it was, it was a, quite a, a lucrative time for many companies in this life science and, and chemical space. Mm -hmm. But now, of course, we're feeling the pain of that. Customers are destocking, so, so that hasn't finished yet. You know that this year will continue to be rough. But I think probably looking outside of the true market, I think that the use of digital tools. Um, mm -hmm. It, I mean, in marketing, in terms of targeting, 
targeted marketing campaigns. Digital tools have been around for, you know, five, seven, ten years even. Yeah. But now people are looking more and more of how can you interrogate things like LinkedIn to look for potential customers? Um, how can you make contact points with a person over things like chat? So mm-hmm. I, I think I think that that really hasn't it started, but it's still early adoption, I think, in, right. in our industry. So I think mm-hmm. that's going to get more and more. That'll be something we, we have to look at. That then, I guess, leads itself into AI. Um, I think AI, I'm not convinced about it yet, but at the speed of change right now, in a year's time, I think it's going to be a completely different landscape. And we're sometimes guilty of looking at it only from our perspective of outbound, you know, selling. Mm-hmm. But our customers are also going to be doing that to find their best suppliers or to find the most, you know, the cheapest suppliers, which yeah. may be bad for us. We, we don't necessarily want to be the cheapest. Sure. So I think that I think that that whole it's not really an ecosystem as such, but I think that will all start to come together. And the danger for us is we're not ready for it. The upside for us is if we do it well, it's another one easy. It could be really quite lucrative. So yeah. I think as, as that digitalization goes into the sales process and the buying process, we'll start to feel it more. I mean, I think you're spot on uh, with that assessment. As a member of the marketing department and a, and a marketer for more than 20 years, I, I see that as well. And that's, that is something that we're currently looking into very carefully. So that's, that's a great piece of advice to, to make sure that we're, we're ready for that. Yeah, absolutely. And can, absolutely. And can optimize it. Speaking of advice, um, what, what would you say is the best piece of professional advice that you've ever received? Yeah, it, it's it's sometimes it, it's the funny things, you know. I mean, um, I think one of them, it, it's a classic, right? It's it's save as draft, count to ten before you press fire on an email you may regret, you know. I that's think a that's good one. <laughs> that is definitely a good one. It's one that sticks with you, right? It's I think sometimes with the use of email and other media, not so much, you know, video and and phone is I think it's easy to misunderstand. People typically don't type with brilliant grammar, although I speak for myself here. You know, it's easy to misunderstand. People rarely mean any kind of malice or they're rarely trying to be deliberately difficult. But sometimes if you're in a bad place, or you're a bit frustrated, maybe they're in the same place. You know, mm-hmm. if it's a draft, pick up the phone, cool everything down and, and just try to understand each other. Yeah. And, you know, if, if you're into these things, when I, I did these personality tests, and they tend to change a little bit, but the fundamentals are, you know, I'm, I'm this kind of red personality trait, so extroverted. <laughs> and then the next color I use is yellow, so it's very charismatic. So it's kind of, it can be great fun, but it can also be, you know, a lot of passion, but too yeah. much of that could be a little bit too much emotion. So it's, you know, I, I think that's one, you know, some people have told me that, so I, I, I try to live by that. Don't, don't send an email on a Friday night when it could probably wait till Monday morning and right. you know, just chill out and, and, and uh, think about it. it it's, hard to, it's hard to transmit nuance uh, in an email or, or a text. I, had yeah. a, I worked with a colleague once who all he did was type in, in red capital letters. And oh. the, first, the first 10 emails I got from him, I thought he was yelling at me. Yeah. <laughs> Come to yeah. discover that that's just what he did, which is crazy, but... You know, again, he didn't mean anything by it, but I, I certainly misunderstood in the very beginning. Yeah, I mean, it's a classic, isn't it? Anything like red or bold or right. not even saying hello at the top of the email. Right, right, right. So, no, I'm, I'm, you know, I think we need to take care of that because we're, we're remote an awful lot more. You don't get to reset with people face to face anymore. You know, it's, it's, we're not always in the office. We're in this hybrid working mode. And I just think it's important to, to, you know, make sure that everybody's on the same grounding, get calibrated together. Okay, so last sort of business-related question, and then we'll get into the, the silly fun stuff. Um, if you could work from any location on Earth, we're probably all doing it now because of, again, the after effects of COVID. But I don't yeah. know that I would necessarily work from my dining room if I could work from anywhere on Earth. So if you could work from anywhere on Earth, where where might that be? So... In, in 2011, I was living in Munich. Uh, I'd been there about eight years. I didn't really want to leave, but that was a pretty special town. It was great. I ended up moving to Eastern Switzerland 
uh, just because that's where the company was moving. And now I live in Basel inside of north, north central Switzerland. But I think if you go south, southeastern Switzerland into the Alps, uh, the nearest town that people would know is where the World Economic Forum is, Davos. There's mm -hmm. two or three small little villages almost around there. It, it's quiet. The connectivity is still good. You know, the views are awesome. Um, you know, in terms of hobbies, I'm a real kind of mountain person, either on a bike okay. or hiking. Yeah, so, so it's just sort of, I, I think that would be it. I mean, when I, was, I lived in Boston, loved it. I traveled the US when I was in Boston, loved the national parks. But it's kind of that sort of mountainous thing. I'm guessing I'd love Colorado as well. I never got to go there, but I'm, I'm, that kind of a vibe would be good for me, sort of where the, you know, the, the life stress is relatively low. You may have work stress, but the life sure. stress is relatively low and, you know, very picturesque, beautiful countryside. So I, I, would, I would plump for Southeast Switzerland, something like that. You are correct about Colorado. I've, I've not been to Switzerland, but I've been to Colorado, and it is, it is gorgeous. It's what I imagine some parts of Switzerland are probably like. Yeah, so. I imagine so, too. Yeah, yeah, it'd be good. So, the silly stuff. What's, yeah. um, what's the best book that you've read recently or movie that you've seen? So, um, everybody's probably heard of Harry Potter. Um, yep. So, the author of Harry Potter is J.K. Rowling. Um, actually, she also writes under a pseudonym called Robert Galbraith, mm -hmm. and it's a completely different genre. Genre. It's more of a, a sort of a um, a detective type series. That's really cool. They're quite meaty books, sort of a thousand pages, so you can really get stuck in for a few weeks on that. So probably that was the last the last book I read. I, I read quite a lot of factual books, like sort of not textbooks on economics or business, but more kind of factual books like. Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, that was kind of cool. And then, but sometimes if you've really got to veg out and it's a movie, I think the last one I voluntarily watched was Maverick, which was awesome. Takes me back to Top Gun, 1986. Ah, uh, so, yeah, that was, that was good. Yeah. It was good, yeah, that's cool. So that's, the, that's probably it. He's got the new Mission Impossible coming out soon, and that promises <laughs> to be really good. Tom Cruise never, never fails. Tom Cruise never, never fails. fails. Never fails, yeah, yeah. So I guess this is a business related question. Um, and in no particular order, what do you think you'll do when you retire? Yeah, you know, I don't know. I think there's, there's, a, there's a load of the world left to see. I mean, I've been quite lucky in that, um, you know, I was, I was born in central England, which is, you know, it, it's quite an industrial area. So I, I escaped from there. I've lived in a beautiful town, Munich. I've lived in Switzerland. I've lived in Boston, Strasbourg. So, I've been very fortunate to have seen different parts of the world and really truly lived there. You mm -hmm. know, three or four years in Boston was amazing, but there's still so much more to see. So I think travel sounds cliched, right? But it's kind of, you know, see the world a little bit. I don't know Asia particularly well. Mm -hmm. And, um, and for sure, I don't know all of the U S that I'd like to see. And I've got some extended family in Canada, which I, I, I mean, the last time I was there, I was 10 years old. So, so definitely travel. Um, and then, I think it would be, you know, I really like the mountains, keeping fit, cycling. It's kind of a big thing for me. So I'd certainly do that. Again, then it depends on the age. You know, if, if I'm retiring at, I don't know, 65, 67, I'd probably sleep a lot more. But, um, you know, if, if, I, if, I, if I manage to get out early, I, I, I don't know. There's, there's other little things maybe. I'm, I'm not sure I'd perhaps leave business totally. Right. You know, I, I've got some perhaps, again, Maybe it's all butterflies and unicorns, but I've got some thoughts about could you, you know, be sort of business consultant, but sure. without the hassle of trying to earn a load of money, but just to right. help, right, help right. start up, that, that kind of thing. So, but, but again, I mean, age is there. You, you, you never know at 64, sure. 65, I might, be, I might be done and just, you know, get out. So, yeah. Well, the, tra the travel sounds great. I mean, I don't know anybody who doesn't want. I don't know very many people who don't want to see the world. I mean, that's obvious. That's a, a valuable pursuit for sure. And, that, and I feel the exact same way. So maybe yeah, you and I, yeah. maybe you and I could take a trip together one day. I said, tell you, Colorado, I'd love it. <laughs> I actually probably should have asked this next question when you were talking about when we were talking about books and films. Any streaming recommendations do you have? I know that I'll, I'll start. I'll go first. I uh, I'm in the middle of Yellow Jackets. If you've heard of that, okay, and, yeah, and it's just uh, it's just amazing. So what do you got? So so it's interesting. It's more like what I what have I've never seen one episode of Game of Thrones. I'm Me quite neither. proud of that. Me I, neither. I, I, 
I, I kind of struggle with the, the sort of the long series. I, I, I get about halfway through a couple of seasons, you know, Breaking Bad, I made about halfway through, Sopranos the same, and then I kind of lose, you know, but um, I don't know whether it gets over to the US in a in lot, but there's um, a series set in, you know, Birmingham, which is near enough my hometown called Peaky Blinders. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so Peaky Blinders is pretty cool. The, the accents there are fairly realistic, a bit cliche, but fairly realistic. Sure. But um, if I was going to do sort of things like, it probably wouldn't be series. It might be, I think if I'm going to lose myself in something stupid, it would be like, a, I don't know, like the John Wick franchise or something like okay. that, you know? Yeah. They're good, they're good movies. Yeah. They are good they're movies. On. And it's, it's like, I don't know, it's just kind of just fantasy in many respects. But, you know, it's quite funny. And, and so sometimes in the winter, if I do a lot of indoor cycling, I, you know, there's different um, apps you can use to like, you know, race against. But in, you know, on, on the side of that, I've normally got my iPad with John Wick on it, and it's just so you've got some some motivation on one side, and and then then a good movie to watch on the other. So, yeah, sure. something like that. But I'm not into the sort of the typical, you know, streaming series so much. Gotcha. So, well, you, you mentioned Game of Thrones. So this doesn't relate completely, but the zombie apocalypse. Which was obviously the, the the topic of many movies and TV shows. What do you think you would do to try to survive the zombie apocalypse? I don't know. I mean, I'm British. We've we've never even held a gun in Britain. They're illegal, so I, I'm not even sure where I'd start. I'd I'd so probably run. I'd, I'd run in the I'd other probably, either that or I'd uh, I'd get old John Wick on it and just go and attack and just see where okay, I end yeah. up. I don't know. Okay. But uh, yeah, I mean, never held a never held a firearm. So. Me neither. I don't much help. <laughs> no, me neither. I'd probably just get and drive in the opposite direction. Try to escape. That's my plan. Something like that, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so Ian, this has been great. Really, I appreciate it. Uh, but we do have a final question. And okay. that is if you were going to write a memoir about your life, what do you think you would title it? And I'll add something to it. And who would play you in the movie? Yeah. <laughs> um so I was on a, a bike holiday, uh, it's, I, I go on a road bike and I was in uh, one of the Spanish islands because it was in the winter so it's a bit warm and there was a guy with me, he doesn't really do as much cycling as me and, and we got lost and uh, I found out where we were and it wasn't where we were meant to be and it was kind of getting quite hilly and he was somewhat losing the will to live. So I think I carried him mentally for about the last 50 miles by saying, I'm pretty sure this is the last climb. <laughs> so, so I think maybe that's my memoir title. You know, it's like, I think this is the last climb. That's a know? great one. Yeah. So, so that would be that. And then who would play me? Well, not that you tell now because uh, I, um, I have no hair, but <laughs> I used to have red hair. When I had hair, it was red. So I'm going to go with Damien Lewis. Who's Damien so, Lewis? He was in Homeland. He was the, the guy in oh. Homeland. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, All right. there you go. Red all hair. Right. Yeah. So I'd probably go with that. He's a handsome dude as well, so he, he would all be good. <laughs> sure, fits perfectly. So Damien Lewis starring in, I'm pretty sure this is the last climb. I'm pretty sure this is the last climb, yeah, that would be it. Ian, thank you so much for taking the time. This has been a truly um, interesting interview, and I appreciate getting to know you a little bit better, and I'm sure that everybody who watches it is going to feel the same way. So thank you so much. You're very welcome. It's great to talk to you. Thanks a million.